It's been five years since 49 lives were innocently taken by the hands of a gunman inside the Pulse nightclub. I relive that day every single day. And I think that's what's so hard about tragedies like this is that if you just watch the, the news coverage, if you just tune in once a year, it's like you tap into it for a brief moment in time and then you can change the channel. But the people that I lost, they, they're still gone tomorrow and the day after that. The pain of survivors and the owner of the nightclub still very fresh, hoping there will be a solution to violence and hate in America. There is a gun violence problem. There is a hate problem. There is a problem bigger than where anyone's really talking about, I think, is, is why is that how we are solving problems? <laughs> through violence and through hateful acts. I mean, why? What makes you think that that, that person's life is not valuable? And on the very day of remembrance, another mass shooting in Austin, Texas, the nation once again rocked by gun violence. They just went and got their guns and started shooting at people. BNC Live starts now. That was the sound of the bell as it rang 49 times. For each of the victims who died in the Pulse nightclub massacre, good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Brittany Jones. It was June 12, 2016 when Omar Mateen walked into Pulse nightclub and killed 49 people and injured dozens. And as we reflect on that tragic day, our nation yet again faced with another mass shooting this weekend, this time in Texas, where more than a dozen people are hospitalized. That's where BNC's Narissa Knight is live tonight. And Narissa, these people were enjoying themselves one moment and then next moment facing terror. And you actually spoke to several witnesses who say they had to duck for cover. What can you tell us tonight? That's right, Brittany. You know this end and prosecute them soon. Live in Austin, Texas, I'm Narissa Knight for BNC. Brittany, back to you in the studio. And Narissa, before you go, you just mentioned the shooters there. They'll now be facing a number of charges. What have you learned? Well, right now we've learned from police that they do have the identity of these victims and of all the uh, people who they believe are shot and of the two gunmen who are responsible. While they initially thought that there were 13 victims, they had then, after going on live on TV, found out there was another who had transported themselves. But they say they are confident that they will get these two gunmen and bring them into custody. And the hope is that all those who are in the hospital right now will survive. Brittany. All right, BNC's Narissa Knight reporting live for us in Austin, Texas. Narissa, thank you. And five years ago, we remembered those terrifying moments of the tragedy that took the lives of 49 people inside the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. A gunman walked into the club and kept shooting until he was killed by police. It's known as one of the worst mass shootings in American history. And tonight, people all across the country are paying tribute to the victims and survivors. That's where we find BNC Stephanie Bertini outside Pulse nightclub. That is now a memorial site. Stephanie, good evening. Good evening. Behind me, a sea of personal stories that give context to the tragedy. And definitely a touching story there, Stephanie. So what is expected for the rest of the evening? We can hear music and things like that going on behind you. So the memorial service here at Pulse is underway for several hours more. It's expected to last. This is for, as I mentioned, the families of the victims and the survivors. There are several more events across Orlando and across the country. All right, BNC's Stephanie Bertini reporting live for us in Orlando. Stephanie, thank you. We'll see you later this evening. An LGBTQ rights activist and founder of Hashtag We Exist, LGBTQ Charlotte Davis, joins us now to talk about what this day means to the LGBTQ community. Charlotte, thank you so much for joining us tonight and welcome to BNC. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And Charlotte, you just heard the stories. We know that you've been out there also all day. Um, I remember getting a call back 
to come back and to work overnight. Uh, my boss at the time had told me several people had been shot that day. I covered Pulse, and unfortunately, we thought at the time it'll be about six people shot. But as I drove into work, it was that number. It just kept growing and growing, and I covered that story for days. It was gruesome. Um, you know, still interviewing people who had blood on their clothes. It was just sad. You know, folks couldn't find their families and a lot of chaos. What does it mean to you to reflect on such a tragedy? We're talking about five years later. And it's hurtful. Yeah. Um, it doesn't get any easier every year. Um, this was not something that you could easily just, you know, get over or move move past. This was our home. This was our safe place. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Uh, definitely. And like I said, just talking to people. I mean, I remember people who weren't able to find their loved ones, searching for them at the hospital. You know, a lot of messages that I've seen today has actually focused on how much progress has been made since Pulse, the shooting at Pulse happened. What do you think has changed so far? Um, well, definitely there has been a lot of um, emphasis on uplifting the black LGBTQ voices yeah. um, that has never been done before. Um, we've been acknowledged in spaces that we've never been acknowledged in before. Um, and a lot of that is because of the voices that continue to ring out to say that we exist and that, you know, we were a part of this as well. We lost people in this as well. Um, and, you know, given the opportunity, our community would love to come together and embrace this um, in a way where we will be united um, and feel united. Yeah. Um, Again, this was, this was something that rocked our community. It shook our community, and it was a time that um, we thought that it would mend everything together, and it actually separated our community a little bit further um, as far as the Latino community and the, the Black LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of progress that's been made thus far, but however, we still have a long way to go, and just the inclusiveness of, um, you know, involving all, in, all communities involved. Yeah. And Charlotte, I can I can still hear the pain in your voice because I know what it was like um, that day for you all experiencing this. So how has this tragedy forever changed the LGBTQ and Latinx communities when it comes to gun violence and prevention? Um, I think that it, it, it brought on aware, an awareness that we can't deny. We can't go anywhere without being aware that this is something that could happen, yeah. um, that may happen. Um, that is a possibility. Um, it's scary. Um, right. It has definitely put a strain on the way folks party um, these days. Um, our, our Black LGBTQ night at Pulse has not been replaced. It's recently um, got a new Friday night, but none of our parties really have been replaced. We really haven't found a new safe spot or safe haven um, of our own. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's been a difficult ride, especially when I'm, you know, when you deal one on one with, with the post survivors and those who lost family members, lost their children um, in that building that night who, you know, um, long to feel a sense of belonging, um, long to feel a sense of um, the unity that they so hear so much about. Um, and, and that's just not a reality for the black LGBT and Caribbean communities. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there have been a lot of efforts that have been made through advocacy and speaking up and raising the voices and, and highlighting those um, nine African-Americans that lost their lives that night and the community who also suffered a great loss, mm -hmm. um, you know, on, on that night. And Charlotte, uh, what message would you send to those families and friends of those who are still struggling with the question of why five years later? I can't, and I really don't know what to say to that when I'm still asking myself the same question. I was just at Pulse um, until about four o'clock this morning um, with some of the survivors, some of the family members out there, and you don't know what to say. You don't know what to say. You know how to give hugs, and that's really what I came to do when I arrived on the scene was to give hugs and give love um, and to be there as a support system for those, um, those that were injured and also those who had lost lives of their family members in, uh, on that night. So it's been it's been very difficult um, finding support for those individuals five years later. You know, one would think that, you know, people should be over things or past things, and that's just not a reality. You have mothers that can't get up out of the bed um, in the morning, can't go to work, um, and, and there just needs to be a sense of, of, of claiming of these, of these stories. Mm -hmm. 
And we know it's certainly heartbreaking. Well, my prayers go out to you and every family and everybody who has been rocked by this. And we appreciate your time tonight. And I thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. Well, it's also been one year since the fatal shooting of Rayshard Brooks and attorneys for his family say they still want justice for his killing. Brooks was shot and killed by an Atlanta police officer outside of Wendy's restaurant after failing a sobriety test. Brooks briefly fought with two officers, taking a taser away from one and then was shot as he ran away. The Stuart Miller Simons law firm says Simmons rather that the Brooks family is being treated like third class citizens after what they call a year of inaction. They want his death taken seriously. And coming up, it's Migraine Awareness Month. Just after the break, a headache specialist breaks down the causes of migraines and how to treat them. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's get you caught up on some other top stories tonight. Today marks day two of the G7 summit in the UK. 13 leaders gathered to discuss pressing issues and coordinate policy. Today's sessions focused on the global recovery from COVID-19 and strategic competition with China. President Biden and French President Emmanuel Macron also held their first formal in-person meeting. The third and final day of the G7 summit will take place tomorrow with climate and economy as key topics. The FBI is now investigating after Oklahoma City police say an unruly passenger calls a Delta flight to make an emergency landing. Listen to this. Police say it happened Friday. Crew members and passengers say the man assaulted two flight attendants and briefly took over the intercom. Police say the suspect was an off-duty flight attendant. They say he threatened to take down the plane. And listen to passenger Benjamin Curley describe what he experienced from his seat near the back of the plane. My first interaction was when the intercom came on, and uh, apparently the um, the perpetrator was on the intercom and was telling passengers to return to their seat because oxygen masks were going to be required of them, and uh, that created quite a stir amongst everyone around us. It became very tense. And once the plan landed, the unruly passenger was taken into custody and transported to an Oklahoma City hospital with minor injuries. Bomb technicians searched the plane afterwards. The plane was able to resume its flight to Atlanta after a three hour delay. And there has been nearly 3,000 reports of unruly behavior by passengers since the start of the year. That's according to a statement released by the Federal Aviation Administration. The agency says about 2,200 reports were about passengers refusing to comply with the federal face mask mandate. The new statistics follow two different viral videos that show passengers needing to be restrained because they disrupted flights. A little tin mother of two is the second winner of the $1 million Colorado comeback cash lottery for getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Listen to this. Stephanie Ward says she has to work two jobs along with her husband to make ends meet for her family. It's been a trying year for her family. She lost her father-in-law to a lung disorder, which she says was not COVID-19. Because of the pandemic, though, they could not have a proper, proper rather funeral service. This is all emotional. As you guys can imagine, I'm super excited that I won the million dollars, but, um, you know, COVID's a real thing. And, um, you know, we ended up losing him. Um, we didn't have a proper service, but um, that's part of the COVID, and that's part of the reason people need to be getting vaccinated so we can get back to normal. Ward says she sympathizes with everyone who had losses during the pandemic. What a blessing to her. Tony? Brittany. Do you ever get a headache that you just can't shake? You're taking medicine, you're drinking water, but your head just won't stop hurting. Well, according, according to the National Headache Foundation, migraines impact at least 40 million people in the U.S. We've all been there before, right? June is Migraine Headache Awareness Month. Dr. Steven Silverstein is with us now to talk about this. Dr. Silverstein, welcome to BNC. Good evening, and thank you for having me. Yes, we are happy I think to what you what you need to understand about migraine, mm -hmm. it's not a disorder of neurotic women, men, women. In fact, there's more migraine among male neurologists than anybody else. Yeah. The way to look at it is 
It's part of the protective system of the brain to avoid overactivity that happened while we were cavemen. So let's look at it that way. It's a protective system. So what can we do to control migraine? Keep our brain from being overactive. Don't starve. Get plenty of rest, mm -hmm. exercise, and relax. Those are the major things that we need to take control of our headaches. And Doc, why are we plagued by this? And so often people tend to suffer in silence about their headaches and migraines, but why is it so important that we also bring awareness to these issues? Unlike the past, we have good, safe medicines that work for medicine, migraine. We have a pill that you can take that will relieve your headache within 30 minutes. You like yoga? That will help you. If you believe in meditation, that will help you. But important, if you start to feel your headache, get away from the noise, a dark, quiet room, and treat early, whether it's an over-the-counter medicine or a prescription medicine, the earlier the better, and don't pretend it's going to go in and out. And Doc, there was actually a survey done by the Headache and Migraine Policy Forum that says there's been a nearly 70% rise in the number of migraine attacks during the pandemic. Is that increased due to folks actually experiencing headaches as a symptom of COVID? I know I had headaches and that was one of the first signs of me going to get tested because I, I couldn't shake it. There are two reasons you get a headache during COVID. One due to the infection itself, due to the stress. We're not leaving the house. We're worried about our friends, our neighbors, and our family. Mm -hmm. Stress triggers migraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was one of those things where it just felt like it, taking medicine and all of those things, it just wasn't working. And that's how I knew. I said, well, something is wrong. Something isn't right. So, you know, you talk about there not actually being a current cure for migraines just yet, but so many new treatments are out there, therapies. Uh, what are those and what can we do to help fight them? You named a few earlier, but are there certain things right. that people haven't tried that they may not know about? Well, first, there's a lot of natural products that you can take. Mm -hmm. Riboflavin, a vitamin. Coenzyme Q10, a vitamin. Getting out and take a brisk walk. In addition to the older medicines we have, like sumatriptan and DHA, there's a whole new class of drugs called g -pants that you can take even if you have a medical contraindication. But just as important, if you have frequent headaches, the trick is to prevent them from occurring. We have everything from Botox to antibodies to g -pants, yeah, compared to when I started to treat a headache, we have so many more things that can be done for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think about sometimes where, you know, you have a headache and you don't know where it's coming from. We'll attribute it to something else. You'll say, oh, well, maybe it's because I didn't eat today or maybe it's because I'm just tired. Some of those things are factors, as you mentioned, but sometimes there are other things that are happening within um, our bodies. Right. So how do you know the difference when you should actually go get checked out because you keep having these continuous headaches and migraines? There's certain basic rules. If you've never had a bad headache before, mm -hmm. check it out. If you have a headache that doesn't go away, check it out. If you have a headache, you can't talk. If you're weak, if you can't function, check it out. The, the secret is, if it's the same thing you've had before and it's gone away, it's likely to be the same old thing. But if not, take care of it as soon as possible. Any resources you'd like to point our viewers to who may be battling this right now? Well, yes, yeah, something at the Jefferson Headache Center where I am, we were looking for something to help people help themselves. Mm -hmm. And we created a website called Control M or Control M Migraine. Most of the materials there, no charge. It will teach you how to take care of yourself. All right. I love it. And I know people needed to hear that. Well, Dr. Silverstein, thank you so much for joining us and weighing in on this for us tonight. We appreciate your time. My pleasure to be here this evening. Indeed. Up next, anger can impact your mental health. We've got some techniques to help you manage it in today's Self Care Saturday. And also, just ahead in BNC Sports, find out what HBCU track and field team is making history on the national stage. Plus, what former Kansas basketball star has an HBCU connection you may not know about. Our James Hill is up next with your King of the Hill.
Welcome back. All this month, we're recognizing Men's Mental Health Month for Self Care Saturday. Experts say men in general find it hard to express their anger and frustration, but tonight, licensed clinical psychologist Dr. Ryan Warner shows you how to effectively cope with anger within the black community. Dr. Ryan Warner, thank you so much for joining us for Self Care Saturday and welcome to BNC. Thanks so much for having me, Brittany. And we are so glad to have you with us because we're talking about something very, very important during Men's Mental Health Month. So, Dr. Warner, so we all actually deal with anger, right? But there are different layers of frustration when it comes to being a black man. Talk about some of those triggers that lead to anger as a black man. Yes. So, as black men, it's it's important to note that we may experience additional challenges compared to other groups. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, we experience systemic racism, right? We may have additional economic uh, challenges, uh, poverty, unemployment. Uh, there may be additional neighborhood stressors as well, uh, living in a violent community, for instance. And ultimately, sometimes we don't really know how to effectively express our anger. Yeah. And it's also important to know that anger is a secondary emotion. So underneath the anger may be pain, maybe hurt, maybe disappointment. And when we don't feel that we have power or control over a situation, mm -hmm. then sometimes we don't know how to effectively express uh, that emotion. Um, so hopefully today we can talk more about some additional strategies about what we can do. Uh, but it's important to first be aware of what anger is and how does it look yeah. for the black community. And how important is it to use it and not avoid it when you have those feelings? So that's that's really hard, right? Because as black men and as men in general, we often think about toxic masculinity and that that ideology. Um, we don't really know how to effectively express that emotion. So we think about toxic masculinity. Um, you know, I know when I was when I was growing up, you know, I learned that to be a man means to really not show any emotion, emotion that is negative. Mm -hmm. For instance, sadness, uh, disappointment, right? Um, and I've also learned that, you know, anger sometimes is looked at um, in, a, in a way that is not helpful. I know I have brothers, obviously, a uh, dad, a uh, fiance, and uh, as black men sometimes, and I'm having conversations with them, it's hard for them to express the frustrations and the different things that they deal with on a daily basis. But, you know, you have to find a way to do it in a healthy way, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, but oftentimes avoidance is easier for us to do, right? Yeah. So, for instance, it's easy, it's easy for us to push down those emotions, to not think about it. And when we do that, in the short term, we may feel that that's helpful for us. We don't have to deal with that difficult emotion during that time. But in the long term, it's actually maladaptive to our well-being. And it may come out in ways that are not healthy. For instance, it may come out a with us taking that anger out on other people, for instance, our loved ones. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe uh, we engage in a emotional or a physical or verbal abuse towards other people, right? So it's important to be aware of how that anger impacts us and what it looks like. But it's also important to know that anger is not always a bad thing. Um, for instance, if, if I'm playing sports, you know, uh, and I'm and I'm kind of upset about how the other team is, is talking to me and maybe I'm losing on the scoreboard, then that anger is going to fuel me. It's going to motivate me to make change and, and help me accomplish that goal at hand. So it's important to know that we're able to control our emotions and control our anger and find outlets to effectively express that, then it can actually be more helpful instead of un unhelpful. Mm -hmm. And so, Dr. Warner, why is it so important, you know, why is it in our black community that black men don't normally go seek help to deal with this? And what are your recommendations for those men who have been experiencing kind of this internal battle, if you will? So number one, let's look at the mental health stigma in the black community. Yeah. And then you add additional layer uh, of being a man, right? And thinking about toxic masculinity and how we have maybe not been taught about how to effectively express our emotions. Or maybe we think that seeking help makes us weak. It makes us vulnerable. Yeah. And no one likes to feel weak. No one likes to feel vulnerable, right? But it's important to know that actually seeking help when you experience the stress actually makes you stronger. Um, because it gives you that control and that power back, mm -hmm. right? So as black men, we have to be able to feel a little bit more comfortable talking about these challenging topics and find avenues that we can effectively express our anger. Yeah, and what are your recommendations for people who are walking away from this saying how I can actually deal with this? 
definitely. So, so number one, we need to establish a broader vocabulary around our emotions. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes as men, we say we're angry or we're sad. Right. But there is more emotions than just feeling down or uh, feeling angry. Right. So, for instance, do we feel disappointed? Do we feel that we don't have control over a situation? Do we feel hurt? Right. So being able to establish additional additional vocabulary around that term is important. So that's number one. And number two, we need to be able to recognize our triggers and our warning signs, mm -hmm. right? So, for instance, if we're driving down the road and our check engine light comes on in our car, then that's a warning sign to cue us to say, hey, we need to do something, right? I need to pull over. I need to get this issue fixed. And we also have internal warning signs that we need to be more aware of. For instance, when you feel angry or disappointed or upset, what do you notice about your physical um, body, right? Does your heart start beating really fast? Do your muscles start to tense up? And then what do you notice about, about your thoughts, right? Do you start to have racing thoughts? Do you have thoughts that you talk down to yourself and engage in negative self-talk? So all of these are important as well to be aware of, and that's going to help us better manage our emotions. All right, Dr. Warner, thank you so much for giving us all this great advice and joining us for Self-Care Saturday. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. And we'll keep you updated. We told you last week. Mm-hmm. It's brewing. We need those storms to invest this energy somewhere else to <laughs> dissipate. That's I what we like need to do. I like how you put, use mm -hmm. that word in there. Yeah, <laughs> invest your energy invest somewhere else. Invest that energy. And use it for some love. How oh, about that? Feel the love? Yes, can you feel the love? Today <laughs> is one of the biggest multiracial holidays in the U.S. That is National Loving Day. So there's some history behind it. National Loving Day is about spreading love and unity. In fact, its name references Mildred and Richard Loving, an interracial couple who was convicted for getting married during the late 1950s. Mm -hmm. The Lovings fought hard and beat the odds after winning their case in the Supreme Court and lifting Virginia's ban on interracial marriage. We've come a long way. Come that's a long you way. All across the board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I, when you was reading that story, I was like, hmm, I never thought about that. I never, where, where did the love word come from? Mm -hmm. And just being in. able to love who you want to love, be who, whoever yeah. you want to marry, what color, doesn't matter. It should yeah. be up to you. This is it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know how to end a Saturday. I know, how, you know, I was like, tracking the chop is like womp, 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 and here you go. <laughs> I feel it. Do you feel yes. it at home? I don't know. We are exchanging love <laughs> on the desk. That's what we got. You feel my energy. We're finally talking. able to touch, you know, yeah. get a little closer to people, you know, mm -hmm. so feeling that. Yeah, and that's, I've been happy to, like, be able to hug folks. I know it's a different type of love, but just being able to do that, exactly. I think it's been, like, a blessing. It's, it's a welcome refresh. It's, like, new and, and improved. It's like, hold on, do I hug you? Do I not? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my mom and I, we talk about that, like, now people feel like, dang, can I, when I walk up to you, should I give you a hug? Because I haven't given you a hug in a year. But now, people are starting to do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're showing you some love in the next hour. Stay with us. Watching BNC Live. More weather, sports, and news coming your way. <laughs>